scripture reading this morning will come from the New King James Version, Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. I ask you to follow along in the Holy Scripture as I read Psalm 23, 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. I ask that you would now join me and bow your heads in a word of prayer that the Lord will, would empower me with a divine unction to speak to your hearts with a message from him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by no means am I a perfect man. The only perfect person that I have ever known is Jesus Christ the Savior. And yet in your infinite wisdom, you have still chosen to use imperfect men like me to preach the perfect message of your holy word. I ask, Lord, that you would invigorate me today, that you would empower my words, that the Clarksburg Church would be fed from your holy word, and that their souls would be refreshed from the Spirit on high. I say this in your Son's precious name. Amen. Well, I want to begin by saying good morning to you all and a happy Sabbath to you. You know, it's been far too long since I've last been here to preach to you from God's holy word. And I am glad for the opportunity to come here today and bring you a message from the Lord. Now, with me coming back here after being gone for three months, a lot of questions are coming up as to, Pastor, how often will you be here? How long will you be here? What exactly does the future hold? And I want to tell you that as far as I'm concerned, it's all good news. And simply this, I will be preaching here every Sabbath. The same sermon series that we go through with Damascus Grace, we go through here. You are on the same page, you gain the same momentum, and I am just as committed to this church as I am the other church as well. Because you see, sometimes, and I know you've all felt this before, sometimes other leaders in the church may treat a smaller church like a second-rate church, as an afterthought or a, the unwanted stepchild of the church family, if you will. But I will never treat you that way. I don't believe I have ever treated you that way. I have always given this church just as much input when we had the three churches. You can ask Bob. Any district decision, he had equal vote. Anytime we decide on the preaching calendar for the year, he had equal say. I gave you equal time when I had three churches, and I plan on giving you equal time now that we have two churches. I believe that by being here to God send, I am here every week. We will preach with consistency, and I firmly believe that the Lord will bless. Because as I look at my other assignment with Damascus, where we have gotten back to preaching the Adventist message, where we are getting back to proclaiming the three angels and being about our mission, God is blessing his church. And I believe that at this time that we are now recovering for the pandemic, people's souls and their hearts are thirsty for God. And I believe that if the Adventist church, the remnant of God, is faithful at this time to proclaim his message in a day of judgment, God will bring people to our church. I've seen it. I've watched it. I know it's happened at Damascus. It has happened at every other church I've ever pastored. And if we are faithful in doing the work, I know that God will do it here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm greatly honored to join with you in moving forward with this mission. Currently, we are actually in the middle of a sermon series that we are calling The Good Shepherds. And I'm going to give you a little synopsis of what we've talked about so far to, to get you on the same page. But this sermon series primarily is about emboldening the pastor and the elders to be the spiritual leaders of their community. In The Good Shepherds, we are going through a deep study of Psalm 23. And as we come to Psalm 23, we are asking the simple question, God, how do you want us 
to shepherd your children. In the first sermon, I looked and taught how we are in desperate need of godly leaders. In that sermon, I talked about how many people have forsaken their godly call to go after earthly pursuits. And as they have done so, they have done almost, almost irreparable harm to the church. The church pastor is not the church pastor. He's now the church CEO, right? It's no longer the pastor's study. It's the pastor's office. They're no longer visitations. They, they're board meetings at this point, right? We are living in a day and age where pastors do not want to be ministers. They want to be celebrities. And this has done almost irreparable harm to the church. But God knew this would happen. And so God is taking the opportunity in the Adventist church, who I believe not only has forgotten their mission, but some pastors have outright abandoned it. But God is raising back up in our church godly leaders who are true to the Bible, they're true to the mission that God has given us. In the second sermon, I talked about how the good shepherds need to know the people that they are pastoring. That the people should not just be a nameless face in a pew, and they should not just be a faceless name on the church roster. But an elder and a pastor must know the people. Not only know their names, but must come to know their heart. To know their fears and their struggles, their joys and their hopes, their dreams, their gifts, the good and the bad. Because as we will see today in this sermon, it is only when a pastor and an elder truly knows the heart of the person that they can spiritually care for them in the way that God desires. I ask you to bow your heads with me for one last moment of prayer as we move into the sermon today. Father, you are gracious and you are good. And I pray, Lord, again that you would invigorate these words with your divine power. For, Lord, to be very frank, I have nothing worth saying. The only things I have worth saying are the things that you have already told me. And so I pray that everything about me would fade away, that every word that was in here that was my saying would be eradicated. But instead, what is preached to the people is the pure word of God coming from your lips through this unworthy messenger, that they would be emboldened to become the nurturing community that we must become in order to keep the people that I know you will faithfully send us. This I pray in your son's precious name. Amen. One of the most precious gifts I have ever received is a little tiny wooden box. If you came into my church office, or actually my home office where it's located, it would not stand out to you. It would not look like anything special. It would look like just an, another old wooden box stained with a few hinges on it, but, but nothing that you would pick up and ooh and ah over. But if you know this box the way I know this box, then you would realize how precious of a gift that box was to me. It was given to me by my late but dear friend, Richard Gould. Richard was baptized as an Adventist in his younger years. He came to the church because of a crusade, but over time, he left the church. He dedicated his life to decades of debauchery and sin, various issues which I won't go into at this time for it's not proper for me to speak of. But then Richard received a wake-up call from God. He was sitting in the doctor's office when the doctor looked at him and said, Sir, you have stage four lung cancer. You are going to die. Me and Richard were able to get to know one another very deeply, oddly enough, in the few months that he was still alive. We had great conversations, sometimes at one o'clock in the morning, sometimes at one o'clock in the afternoon. And in those conversations, he confided in me that he was unsatisfied with his life. He was unsatisfied with what he could leave behind, or in other words, what he did not have to leave behind. He had no inheritance to leave his children, 
He had no house to bestow upon them. He didn't even have a well-lived faith that he could present to the generations to follow. And I remember him looking me in the eye and saying, Pastor, my life was meaningless. And of course, as a pastor, you want to encourage the people. And I, I don't even remember exactly what I said. It probably wasn't the best of things. It, I stumbled over. I remember tripping over my tongue. It was like, no, 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 Richard. Your life is not meaningless. God still has a plan for you. God has a plan for all of his children. If you just have faith, God will do something amazing. Now, of course, I believe that in my mind, but even driving home, I wasn't so convicted in my heart. What is God going to do with a man who only has two or three more months left to live, who can't even catch his breath enough to leave his bed? Well, that night, Richard went to the Lord in prayer. For the first time in his life, he heard God audibly speak to him. It was only a few simple words. Richard... Go to your wood shop. And so, going against any um, <laughs> recommendation of the doctors, and certainly against the protests of his wife, Richard got up out of bed, grabbed his cane, and made his way out in the snow and ice to his wood shop. And as he walked in, he instantly understood. He still had something of value to hand to people. His talent of woodworking would allow him to leave maybe a few gifts to some other people that they would then know how much he valued them. And so literally, with his dying breaths over the next two months, he created three small wooden boxes to give to the pastors who meant the most to him in order to protect their Bible. He gave one to John Bradshaw of It Is Written, who personally wrote back, by the way. I was very pleased. He then sent one to Pastor Doug Batchelor of Amazing Facts, who personally called him on the phone to thank him for the gift. And then he left one to little old me. And to this day, and maybe I got something that Doug and John didn't get, I like to brag about this, Richard, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, because he was still coming to church those last 12 weeks, he stole my Bible. <laughs> After church one day, I'm like, and you all know me. Like, I leave things everywhere. I really do. It's, it's my way of even after I leave you, like, ah, Pastor's water bottle's still here. Gosh, you know, what, what, what a weird guy, but you know, he sure loved us, <laughs> you know? Well, he took my Bible, so I thought I just lost it. But what he did was he took it home to measure it so he could specifically make the box to match my preaching Bible of that time. And then he bestowed upon me the box, and again my Bible, as a thank you for all that I've done. And that box, it doesn't look like much, but it's precious to me. It is of inestimable worth, because if something ever happened to that box, why, well, Jay, I would never be able to replace it. I couldn't get one off Doug, I couldn't get one off John. And even if I did, it would not be the one that Richard made for me. So I don't let anyone touch it. I do not let my wife dust it. I don't let my kids play with it. I won't even let the dog smell it. I actually had it in my hands and thought, I should bring this to church to show people. Then I said, hmm. How I forget things, it's probably best you just stay right here. Because if something happened to that, I would be brokenhearted because that box is so precious to me. Because that box, in a very real way, was bought with the blood of someone who loved me so. And what, oddly enough, is true for that box to me is also true of you toward God. God loves you because you are precious to him. He literally died for you that you would be able to come back home. And just like I took good care of that box because it was precious to me, God asked me as the pastor to take good care of you because you are precious to him. 
right before Paul was on his way going to Rome, where we know in prison he would eventually die, he was able to meet with the elders at the church of Ephesus. And as he called the Ephesian elders to come to him, he wanted to remind them their charge as elders. Now, I say elders here, but biblically, a pastor is an elder. The only difference between me and YJ and Bob is that I get paid for what I do and can do it full time. Biblically, that's the only difference. Biblically. Of course, I went to school. There are some other things. But the reality is YJ and Bob, as far as ordination goes for elders, are just as ordained as I was this last week. Okay, And so he calls the elders to himself to remind them their charge. And this is what he says to the elders. He says, you must, quote, care for the church because Jesus bought them with his own blood. Do you realize how valuable you are in the eyes of God? Jesus bought you with his precious blood as it trickled down from that cross. Jesus literally poured his blood and his sweat and his tears into saving you. God so loved you that he gave you his only begotten son. That should you believe in him, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. As the apostle John said to us in 1 John 3, 1, do you see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God? For that is exactly what you are. You are a child of the heavenly King, precious in the eyes of your Redeemer. And because you are so precious to God, God commands, in fact, He outright demands that because you are so precious to him that I make sure to care for you with the utmost diligence. And that is why I honestly can say to you that I would treat you just as well as I treat any other church. And that is why I can proclaim to you that I always have treated you just as good as I have treated any other church. Because God, you, Clarksburg, whether you have 12 people or 8 people or 100 people, it does not matter. You are precious in the eyes of the Redeemer. And because you are precious to my God, you are now precious to me. And thus I must give an account to God and say, I took care of your precious treasure with the best I was able to do by getting led by your strength. God says to us in Hebrews 13, 17, speaking to the people, but about the elders, he says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they are ones who keep watch over your souls. They keep watch over your souls. Now we're going to talk a lot more about what the soul is later this year. Toward the end of the year, we have a sermon series coming up about sanctification. How does Jesus make you to be like him in your heart? And so we'll uncover the soul a lot more during that time. But for the sake of this sermon, let me give you a little snippet of what it means in this context so you understand how I must shepherd you. Very simply, biblically, the soul is not the part of you that instantly goes to heaven or hell, right? We know that's not the case. Biblically, the soul is the most important aspect of who you are. As you read through the entire Bible, your soul is where your thoughts, your feelings, your decisions, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, all of that occurs inside your soul. This is why God says to you in Proverbs 4.23, Guard your heart or your soul, same word there, with all diligence, because from it flow the wellsprings of life. In a very real way, you live from your soul. But as we go further, not only do you live from your soul, but that part of you is where God fellowships with you. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, the same word there, with our soul, that we are beloved children of God. 
No wonder then Jesus could honestly say, blessed are the pure in heart, or blessed are the pure in soul. Why? For they shall see the kingdom. They shall see God. When you are pure in heart, you are able to see God, for this is where God meets you. Your soul is the most precious part of who you are, and God says that your elders must keep watch over it. Now, this is what makes an elder's ministry, YJ, such a sacred ministry. Because above all else that Bob and YJ and Stanley and me, above all else that we are called to do, we are primarily called to be a caretaker of your soul. A good elder shepherd. And I, I prefer that word. If, if, if I could change the words we use in church, I would change the word elder to being shepherd. I think that's a, a much better connotation. God called them shepherds, so if he can call them shepherds, I can call them shepherds. But we have to work with the language we have, so now I call them elder shepherds. A good elder shepherd is in tune with how you are doing spiritually. They know the spiritual health of those who are under their care. Speaking to the greatest shepherd of all time, David says to God, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, to be honest, those words are so deep, I could literally preach an entire sermon series just from those two words. When I made the sermon series through Psalm 23 that we are now going through, I threw out 80% of what I learned. And a lot of it was just in these two words because that's how deep the Bible is. The Bible is so deep that you will plunge deeper and deeper. I had to get rid of so much wisdom just to be able to keep it in these last few weeks. These are dear and precious words. But when David says, your rod comforts me, he is referring to, to a ritual that shepherds went through during the days of Israel. And what they would call this was the ritual of passing under the rod. And very simple is a fancy way of just saying that, in, that a shepherd every morning would do a thorough examination of the sheep. The idea came from when the sheep were in the pen, the shepherd would put the rod down to block them, and only one by one would he open up his rod to let them come through, thus passing under the rod. And as they passed under the rod, the shepherd would open the fleece, looking for any signs of trauma or wounds. He would scan his hands through their body, feeling their muscles, making sure they're healthy on the inside, he would look in the eyes. He'd even look in their nose for any sign of disease and sickness. The shepherd thoroughly examined his sheep because the moment he could see the sheep was in pain was the moment the shepherd could bring about their healing. And what the shepherd did for the sheep then is exactly what God asked your elders to do for you now. Just as the shepherd would go through and would examine the sheep, so an elder must examine your soul to make sure that you are spiritually healthy. I've already implemented this at Damascus. And again, we all know that with you all moving back in to join me, you know, we have to all get back on the same page again. And we will. I promise you in a few weeks we will. But something I established there that I will be establishing here as well is a monthly call system. There, the elders are in charge of 10 to 15 people that they must call on a monthly basis. Now, of course, we don't need to have that here. We're not big enough at this time for that to happen. But instead, I will then begin calling you every single month. But when I call you, you need to understand this. The call is not just a fellowship call, okay? We do that other times and other times it's appropriate. This is not one of those times. When I call you, it's not to say, hey, YJ, when's Mary making that good old, you know, food? Are you coming over and get some more in my tummy? It's not one of those times. This is a spiritual call. How is your soul doing? How is your devotional life? What, how do you want to grow spiritually this year? Where are you struggling? Where are you doing good? 
Where do you need me to come alongside you so that you can flourish spiritually the way that God wants you to flourish spiritually? And the, per, the very reason why those phone calls are spiritual in nature is because I am supposed to be a caretaker of your soul. And contrary to popular opinion, our spiritual lives can get sick. They're not always as healthy as they should be. And they're not always as healthy as we want them to be. Now maybe your spiritual life is alive and vibrant, and if it is, we all can say amen and hallelujah, right? We are grateful if that's the case. But let's be honest. Yes, there are times that we feel vibrant and alive. But there's other times we feel plateaued and stagnant. And even during the worst seasons of life, sometimes we feel like our spiritual life itself is sick and it's dying. David himself went through this. During that very terrible time when he sinned with Bathsheba, his entire life was crumbling around him. His very spiritual life was on the verge of dying. In Psalm 42, 11, he describes this time. You all will recognize the verse. He says, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul. Why are you so disturbed within me? When he says that his soul is downcast, he is referring, listen, to the life-threatening predicament of a sheep becoming cast. When a sheep became cast, very simply, they were like a turtle. <laughs> They've fallen on their back, <laughs> and they can't get back on up. <laughs> I remember the first time in New York whenever I saw this happen. Now, when I say New York, I don't mean New York City. Believe it or not, There's more to New York than New York City. No matter how much them city folk want to think New York's only about the city, there's a whole nother state above them, and we got cows. And we got sheep. I remember the first time I went onto my grandfather's farm, and I saw a sheep lying on its back kicking. And I thought this was just the funniest thing in the world. Oh, Grandpa, look, that sheep is so fluffy. <laughs> It can't even roll over. He says, Sean, that's no laughing matter. That sheep is cast. I didn't know what that meant. What does that even mean? He said, when the sheep is on his back, the gases begin to build inside. And as the gases build, they create pressure. And that pressure will cut off the blood flow to the sheep's vital organs. Shawnee, if we don't get that sheep back on its feet, that sheep will die. And the very same thing that can happen to the sheep, David is saying, can happen to your soul. That if we are not careful, just like the sheep, the soul can also become cast. It can happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe we neglected our devotional life. Maybe we allow a certain sin to just run rampant and devour our character and reputation. Maybe we went through a busy season of life and the soul just got burnt out. Maybe, like the rest of us, we went through a pandemic. Things weren't the same as they used to be. We didn't know how to handle the pressure. And over time, the soul became deeply wounded. There are many reasons the soul can become cast, but that's not the important point. The important point is that when the soul does become cast, it needs someone to come along to help it, to heal it, and to fully restore it back to the way it should be. And that is exactly what the shepherd did for the sheep. The precious promise of God to you today is this, that even though the soul can become sick, even though it can get into a life-threatening predicament, where the spiritual life is on the verge of dying, God promises that the soul can be restored. That's what happened to my friend Richard at the beginning of the story. He left God. He abandoned God. He, de he neglected his devotional life. He gave his life over to sin, the truths that he once adhered to. He threw out the window. And over time, his soul became sick. But in that pronouncement, Richard, you have cancer. God also said to him, not vocally, but in his spirit, your soul can be restored. And so he came back to church. Why? Because he wanted to get back on his spiritual feet. 
And that is the promise that God gives to you. Psalm 23, 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. That is what it means when we say an elder keeps watch over your soul. We're not just looking for something bad. We are looking to make sure you're spiritually healthy. Because should you stumble, should you be sick, and should you struggle, you should never walk through that all by yourself. Two are better than one, right? For they have a good return on their labor. For if one falls down and he has no one there, who can help him up? I'm paraphrasing, of course. But when they have two and his brother falls, he has his brother who can pick him back on up. And that is what God is asking us elders to do for you. That when there is something wrong, we are to come alongside you to make sure that you have a full recovery. And that's exactly what a shepherd did for the sheep back in the day. When we went over to take care of my grandfather's sheep, the first step was to grab its hooves and lay it there on its side. Now, my grandpa was old school. If you're there, you're working, <laughs> okay? You're, you're not watching TV. You're not in there with grandma making an apple pie. You're out in the fields working because chores had to get done. So, of course, I got to go help him. So we grabbed the hooves, and, and, and we put the, the sheep on its side. And then my grandfather began to gently rub its stomach in order to relieve the pressure. We were there for, it felt like, forever. But only as the pressure in the stomach was relieved could we then pick it up on the feet? And my grandfather said, Shawnee, you can't just put a sheep back on its feet. Sheep's gonna fall. The sheep is not strong enough to stand on its own, but it also needs to stand if it's gonna heal. He goes, we gotta hold the sheep up by our own strength. And so we picked up the sheep, and me being the small kid I was, I had to kind of put my shoulder underneath that thing to hold it on up. And I really wasn't. You know, I thought I was, but really it was my grandfather who wrapped his arms around that sheep to hold up. But my grandfather stood there for a good 10 to 15 minutes holding the 70-pound sheep up with his own strength because the sheep was not yet strong enough to stand. And then, in a way, I still don't understand how he did it. He had the sheep in one arm, and he began to gently massage the sheep's legs to get the blood going back in. He says, Shawnee, it's not enough just to le let the sheep go. We got to stay here long enough for the sheep to make a full recovery. And then he let the sheep go. And I was so excited because the sheep began going. And then, boom, boom, <laughs> flopped right back over. He says, Shawnee, that's also true. He laughed. Well, Shawnee, that also happens. Sometimes you fix them, and they fall right back down. He goes, guess what, Shawnee? I'm like, apple pie time? <laughs> he goes, no, <laughs> we gotta go do it again. And we sure did. Went right back over, right back on the side, massage the stuff, the whole thing again. He says, Shawnee, a good shepherd, stays with their sheep until they make a full recovery. And that is exactly what your pastor and your elder should do for you. Now, of course, I am not perfect, and probably in preaching this next portion, I will probably condemn myself, okay? Understand, even pastors grow. But the reality is we live in a church environment, no offense, I'm not speaking about you specifically, but I'm talking church at large, where the people give very little care to helping one another. Oh, Alter Grace, you're suffering. Let me give you a five-second prayer here at church. But then they don't call you. They don't write you a card. They don't ask you how things went right? And then you come back in two to three weeks of the praise, and you can tell on everyone's face they had completely forgotten about what you said. Okay, it's happened to me. It happened to me as a pastor. I could tell no one remembered anything I had said. That is not the kind of care that God wants you to receive. God wants you to receive better care, holistic care, the kind of care where an elder comes to you and refuses to leave you the time that you need them. And as you hear that description of what my grandfather and I did for the sheep, isn't that a beautiful description of the way a church elder or a pastor should be taking care of you? When you go through a difficult time, they are a good elders committed to staying with you until your soul makes a full recovery. 
They are committed to relieving your pain, getting you back onto your feet, helping you to gain life once again, and once you have strength, to be able to walk on your own. But a good elder shepherd also understands healing is a process. You might start walking on your own again, and you may fall right back flat on your face. But a good elder doesn't say, ah, to, to you, I ain't gonna help you anymore. No, a good elder, a good pastor comes back, says, you're hurting again. Well, don't worry, because I never left you. And they'll pick you back up and walk again with you until you're strong enough to be on your own. It is the pastor and an elder's job to stay with you for as long as it takes for your soul to become vibrant again. But a good elder shepherd is going to go further than that. They are not only going to stay there with you, they are going to connect you back to the church who also can support you and take care of you. Again, in Psalm 23, verse 4, as I read earlier, David lovingly says to God, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, you will hear the other sermons for the series later. But in a previous sermon, I talked about how the, the, the shepherd took the staff and he would use it to hook the sheep to pull them to himself because he wanted to bond with them. But a shepherd would also use the staff for one more thing. Not only would he hook it and bring them into himself to bond, he would also bring them to the other sheep so they could love on one another. Now, sheep are dumb creatures. I don't know if you know this, but they're very stupid, okay? But they're also very loving. They're like us. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not exactly as bright as they should be, but they're also very loving. They are social creatures. And believe it or not, even in a herd, the sheep make friends. There are some sheep that they like better than other sheep. And a good shepherd knows this. So what they will do is after a sheep has healed from being cast, they know that sheep is afraid. They know that sheep is hurting and it wants the comfort of the herd. So the shepherd will take their staff, hook it around the sheep's midsection, walk it to the flock, and put it right there by its best friends. And you know what those sheep will do? They will be in, bah, bah. They get all excited. They start prancing. They start hopping, right? If you ever see like those, those old um, uh, Disney movies that have the, the lamb and the, it's just hopping like that. That's what they do. They, they literally do that. It's, it's weird but adorable. And they all come up to their friends. Remember, their friend was gone. Their friend was in danger. And they knew that, but they can't do anything. And they go up and they, they, they nuzzle one another. And they begin to rub their fleece against one another in a way of telling the other, you're going to be okay. You're back with us again. And that is exactly what a good elder shepherd should do for the people in their congregation. It is not enough just to connect you to me. I must also connect you to one another. God commands us in Galatians 6, 2 to carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so a good elder shepherd will intentionally connect you with other people in the church that he knows can help you. People who can support you. People who understand. People who have been where you have been and have lived to see another day. People who know how to pray over you to saturate your soul with the Spirit of God to carry you to His throne where alone you can be healed. Because let's be honest, who of us wants to walk through life by ourselves? When we are hurting, don't we want the loving embrace of our church? Don't we want the loving embrace of one another? Even if they don't know what to say, isn't it good to get a gentle hand on the shoulder and say, Montel, I know what you're going through, but don't worry, I've been where you are, and everything's going to be okay. It is as we do this for one another, Listen to me, as we do this for one another, this is when we change from being a church building to being a church fellowship. And that is what God desires the elders to do, to bring you and connect you to one another, that by each other's faith, you will become strong. But there's even more that we must do besides that. 
For as good as it is for the elder to come beside you, for as good as it is for the elder to bring you into fellowship with one another, it is not enough. An elder cannot just connect you to one another. An elder must also connect you to God. See, God may give me the responsibility of overseeing and watching your soul, but to be honest, I am limited at what I can do. I didn't make you. I didn't fashion you. I I didn't knit you together. I can speak to you. I can talk to you. But it's not like I can reach my hand into your pain or into your sin and grab it and pull it out. I I don't have a bucket of righteousness that I can reach into and grab and and put in your heart. I wish I did. That would make make life a lot better and easier, wouldn't it? (laughs) But I don't have that. The only one who can fully restore your soul is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is only He who can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it's only the Holy Spirit, that great comforter at that time, who can change you from the inside out. I'm reminded at this time of the story of the paralytic in the New Testament, who Jesus healed when his friends carried him to Jesus. Now, he has some good friends. Look, I got some friends, but I don't know if they would carry me if I'm paralyzed somewhere. Certainly, they're not going to carry me four or five miles to get to Jesus. (laughs) This man had good friends, but those good friends understood that they were limited. They could not bring about his healing, but they knew the one who could. They knew it was Jesus. They couldn't fix it, but they could carry him to the one who could. And so those friends faithfully picked that man up, walked him to where Jesus was, climbed a house. See, we often talk about the roof thing, but we often forget they got that man on top of a roof. Okay, we never talk about that. I don't know that, like a pulley system. I don't know what they did. They got that man up. They broke some lady's roof. (laughs) And then they got that man back down. And do you remember what Jesus said? When Jesus saw their faith, not just the man's faith, all of their faith, he looked to that man and said, my child, your sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk home. Instantly that man was healed because they understood their limitations. They couldn't do it but they could carry him to the one who could. And that is precisely what me and YJ and Bob and Stanley must do for one another and we must also do for you. There are times in your spiritual walk where you are struggling, where it's hard, where the soul is burdened, but we cannot fix that issue. But what we can do is bring you to Jesus Christ to lay you at his feet and allow he who conducts the ministry of healing to heal you in the deepest parts of who you are. That is why we bathe you in prayer. One of my favorite um, times I had with you all is when we did that small spiritual retreat here in the sanctuary, right? It was your time alone, time of song, time of prayer. And why I love that moment so much, besides the Spirit was clearly here, was because the Spirit was able to do in that moment what I know I never could, that in His presence He could heal you, He could speak to you, He could guide you, and He could restore your soul. That is why we bring each other to Jesus. The Bible speaks about hard times. It says in Psalm 23, 4 through 5, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. There are times in our lives, brothers and sisters, where our souls feel like they're going through those dark valleys. It feels like the enemy of this world and the kingdoms of darkness are hitting us as absolutely hard as they can. 
And sometimes when that happens, our soul is on the verge of dying. But here God reminds us that even when we go through those times, He is with us. That even when the world attacks us, He prepares a table of fellowship to spend time with us. And as we spend time with God in that moment, He not only uh, helps our soul revive, He helps our souls to thrive. As a pastor and elders, we know that the struggles of this world threaten to pull you away from Jesus. But being the good shepherds we are, who are watching your soul, who are monitoring your spiritual health, if it looks as if you have been hurt in any way, you have our promise that we will not only come alongside you, we will not only bring you back to the fellowship, but we will bring you to the feet of Jesus. Because when we place you in his hands, he alone will be the one able to restore your soul. So in closing, let me say this. An elder's ministry is a most sacred ministry. Above everything else we are called to do, we are called to be caretakers of your soul. God has asked us to keep watch over your souls because despite our best intentions, our souls can be in danger. Our spiritual lives can become sick. But God promises you that when your spiritual life is on hard times, when you're going through struggles and the enemy of the world attacks you, you do not need to stay there. That is not the way life is always going to be. He promises that your soul can be restored. And you have our commitment that we will come alongside you. We will stay with you as long as is necessary. If it is hard on you, then it's going to be hard on us because we are going to carry you. Your burden is my burden. And my burden is your burden. That is why we are a family. We carry one another's burdens that we may fulfill the law of Christ. We will be with you for as long as you need us. We will connect you to other Christians who will embolden you to live a spiritual life. And most importantly, we will leave you in the hands of Jesus. For he alone has the power to fully restore your soul. And as we leave you in the hands of Jesus Christ, your pastor and elders can confidently say of you, Surely goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their life and they shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would open up to one another about our spiritual hurts. We pray that you would help the elders to become wise, to see where the other people are at spiritually. Lord, may we bring them to you May we place them in your hands. May you grant them comfort. May you grant them strength. And above all, Lord, in your goodness, may you grant them healing. I know those who listen to this sermon now live and those who are listening over the live stream and those who will listen to the recording, they will go through spiritual trauma. But Lord, they do not need to stay there. For even in that pain, there's a still and a small voice saying, my child, I am here. The pain does not need to last forever. But if you will trust in me, I will bring you to those living waters. I will bring you to those green pastures. I will sit you down beside the still rivers. And there I will restore your soul. Give us restoration, Father. Invigorate our spiritual lives. May they be as vibrant and bright as the new day sun so that as all people look upon us, what they really see is the love of Jesus Christ. This we pray in your son's precious name. Amen.